So a lot of creators have dipped their toe into NFTs, some more successful than others. I think that what people are really missing on the creator side is this is e-commerce. You're trying to convert your audience to buy a thing and then they want to feel like they have commiserate value. Hey everyone, welcome back. And today we have Phil Ranta with us. Now, Phil, as we always do, we like the guest to do the introductions because we always never can get it quite as good as the guest does. So I love it. Please. Yeah, I'm all about it. So today yeah. on the podcast, we have Phil Ranta. Uh, <laughs> so I've been working in digital media for about 15 years, first as a creator, and then I moved over to the business side. So early in my career, uh, I had a show on superdeluxe.com and I did a lot of mobile content and mobisodes for Verizon's Vcast and other digital outlets. This was all pre-smartphone. Um, my career on the business side started taking off when I was employee number nine at a company called Full Screen, where I was tasked with uh, running their creator division. Uh, we didn't know what that meant. We didn't know what a creator network was at that time, but we grew pretty quickly and within three years had a successful exit to Otter Media, which is a joint venture between Chernin and AT&T. And then I went over to be chief operating officer over at Studio 71, which was another kind of digital uh, management outlet. Um, had a successful exit there to Pro Sieben. Um, and then I jumped headfirst in the game streaming space. I was at Mob Crush running their com creator network for a bit. They just had an exit, which is awesome. Um, and then I went over to be head of gaming creators over at Facebook. And now I'm the chief operating officer at a company called Wormhole Labs that does the first ever user-generated metaverse that we'll be launching very soon. Oh, man, what, what I was going to say, a, pr a relatively impressive CV there in terms of what you've done. Well, I was, I was actually going to ask, how did someone with so few credentials get on a podcast like created? Yeah, go figure, right? No, I'm just, that's the weird thing is I feel like I've, my career is deeply random because what I didn't also mention in between there is I'm an angel investor in a bunch of digital startups. I sit on boards and advisories for a bunch of other ones. And through most of the early part of my career, I was also a struggling comedian, so... Actually, look, I did before the, I did we the whole thing. before we launch, like we're we're going to talk a, a bit about NFTs today and, and how that works, um, especially for creators in the creator space. But let me just tell me about this comedian element. So uh, when I was in college, <laughs> I did a lot of stand up and improv comedy. Uh, I went to college at University of Michigan, so not necessarily a comedy hotbed, but they had a stand up uh, comedy club and an improv comedy club close to campus. So I was just a regular rat there, where I was just doing as many shows as I could. And then the show that I shot that sold the Super Deluxe was a semi-scripted show that I did with a bunch of people who were part of the Ann Arbor, Michigan comedy community. One of them is actually Tim Robinson, who now is, has his own sketch show on Netflix. So he was just a 22-year-old kid like I was at that time, but you know we were just kids with cameras, but he, he went out and made good on it. So actually, after the mobile phone company that I worked for, that cratered pretty quickly because when the iPhone came out and content became free, that company went from flying very high to gone very quickly, which is pretty common in the digital media space when a bubble bursts. But uh, at that point, it was right after the 2008 crash, digital was struggling. And it was, I mean, even though I was in a VP level position, I couldn't find anything. So I went and performed comedy on cruise ships for a little while for extra money before I ended up at full screen. So were you doing the material on text based stuff like were you like don't you hate it when your mobile phone has no reception it was definitely and you're nerdy. like you, it, it was i mean it was nerdy <laughs> stuff but i feel like i i just kind of come from that background i've been a lifelong gamer and you know so yeah I, I wasn't the i wasn't like the cool i mean at that point it was like dane cook was the cool comedian i wasn't that right so i wore my nerdiness on my sleeve nice I'm interested as well, before we get into the real hardcore technical stuff we're going to talk about today, your passion for this, where did that stem from? Uh, I think it stemmed from my love of video games and early AOL. You know, like I was a, an, uh, you know, I, I was born in 82, so my first console was the Atari 2600. And then we, I got a Nintendo right when I was old enough to appreciate and kind of grew up through the console generations. And then it was around junior high when we got our first dial-up modem, which is a perfect time to get a dial-up modem. So I became addicted, like all kids at that age who were computer kids. Like I got super into HTML and making your own websites and chat rooms and like putting on fake personas and trolling people. And like I did the whole thing. Um, so when I graduated college, I graduated with a film degree because I thought I was going to be like the next SNL writer. Um, so I was a screenwriting focus. 
but I got, uh, it was in 2005 and it was right as YouTube was taking off and I was like, all right, free hosting. Cool. So I could start shooting comedy <laughs> sketches with my friends and put it up somewhere and get free hosting. And I just got addicted to the lack of gatekeepers because I was trying to pitch my show around Hollywood and I'm like, who are these idiots who are telling me whether or not my stuff is funny and deciding for the whole world what they should be able to see? I think deep down inside, I have anger management issues, even though I always have a smile on my face. I'm like, screw these people. What? You don't think I'm funny? My friends think I'm funny. So I started just gravitating towards the internet because there was no gatekeepers. And that kind of carried me through my career. Well, that is yeah, incredible. It's like, a, like we would say, you know, it's, it's a generation of access. We have... Uh... There's so many opportunities, but there's no gatekeepers. So everyone's flying onto these platforms and now everyone's vying for attention and trying yeah. to find a way to make money here, isn't it? it that's, it's uh, one of those things that just keep evolving. I was actually just in a previous conversation with someone uh, and we were sort of reminiscing about the old days, which is like five years ago, mm. um, where people were like, oh, you know, YouTube, but how are you making money there? Oh, how crazy making money there? And and now it's not just YouTube, but there's a myriad of, of, of opportunities to make money and, you know, grow value. And, you know, one of the big areas that's coming up is um, NFTs. And yeah. it's something that I think a lot of people are talking about and a lot of people also don't know much about. That's fair. I mean, it's a confusing yeah. market. Frankly, those of us who are even... So I've been kind of on the NFT tip since CryptoKitties, which was about two and a half years ago, and just as a gamer and a curious person, right? So I heard there was this thing where you could buy kitties on a blockchain and breed them, and they could be worth more money, and it's kind of like gambling and fun. So I'm like, heck yeah, I'll go spend a couple hundred dollars buying and breeding cats. Why not? What I didn't know at that time is... It was being run by a company called Dapper Labs, who now makes NBA Top Shot, which is pulling in over $200 million a month in NFTs. And they haven't even launched their mobile gameplay, Hardcore, yet, where you can use moments and upgrade moments through a mobile game. And as soon as they have, now it's like, for, for how impressive their revenue is, and it seemingly came out of nowhere... Just wait, because when that starts happening and other people are building on the Flow blockchain, which is all theirs... Like it's, it's going to be bonkers, bonkers, bonkers revenue. Like it'll put Fortnite to shame or Epic to shame. Hopefully we'll see. Um, but yeah, the NFT thing right now is very much a bubble. It's very 1.0. People are putting GIFs and, uh, JPEGs up on a blockchain and saying scarcity unto itself equals value. So buy this picture I took of my backyard for a thousand dollars. And sometimes suckers are doing it and they think that that thing's going to turn into two thousand dollars and 98 percent of the time they're wrong so we've got to wait for all the chaff to go away in order for us to get to 2.0 which is nfts which i don't think i even explained what nfts were leading into this but i probably should have well, but <laughs> well let's, let, let's let's do that let's let's do, because yeah. there are like i said um especially in the creator space like a lot of creators are interested because they've you know they they've um they've heard about this new concept but they don't quite understand how it works so maybe yeah, yeah. let's let's go foundationally up I'll try to let's start super... with what NFT stands for. <laughs> right, right. We'll we'll go super, super foundational. And if I start getting too nerdy on it, which I have a tendency to do, please cut me off. But NFT stands for non fungible token. So fungible just means that it's able to be traded for something of equivalent value. Like a dollar is fungible. I give you a dollar, you give me a dollar back. We feel like we're even. You wouldn't say like the serial number on that dollar is different than the serial number on mine. So you owe me like it's fungible. It can be traded back and forth. So non fungible is nothing has equivalent value. Everything is unique. So even if I have say a an NFT of a picture of a cat and you have an NFT of the picture of the same cat, but one is serial number three and the other one's serial number six, they can have different values, right? You put them up on a website, one might sell for $6, one might sell for $10. So, and a token is just something that exists on a blockchain, which is kind of like a, like any other token, it's something that represents a thing of value. Like the way you used to get arcade tokens when you were a kid and drop it in a machine and it was worth 25 cents there, right? So put them all together and it's two the things that have unequal value that live on a blockchain right and what a blockchain means is it's something that lives within a anonymized ledger online where so for example bitcoin is on a blockchain or ethereum you might have heard of those things or anything else that's on coinbase and these things just live as data files on top of the blockchain so they're stable because they're decentralized which means they live across a lot of servers and there's a ledger of ownership saying that it's gone from this wallet to this wallet to this wallet and that unto itself makes it a really interesting commodity because it can be traded. Like if Elon Musk owned it before, then it would be more worth more value because of the chain of ownership before it. So 
It's a very Wild West market right now, and anything can be on the blockchain that can be a digital file, and people are just trying to figure out what to do with it right now. And of course, like they always do on the internet, they pick the most boring thing first, which is mostly JPEGs and GIFs. Some of them by like cool artists like Beeple, who deserves every dime that he gets. A lot mm. of it is like, I don't know if you read the, the article about a, a filmmaker in New York who sold his fart as an NFT. There's a fair <laughs> amount of that. Right, there's a fair amount of junk, but that'll all clear out in this generation when they realize that there's no value to something that's scarce, but you know, it's scarce and that's it, right? Speaking of junk, um, I, a friend of mine sent me a, a post about an NFT, which is basically um, for ladies who get unsolicited dick pics from um, people, what they can basically do is take it and make an NFT and basically yeah. <laughs> get the person who sent it to them to buy it back for them so that they <laughs> yeah. that they can have that. And it's, uh, it was an interesting model. It was, it's it's uh, one of it's the a- scariest parts about NFT is, I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast, but the DMCA governs a lot of takedowns, right? The Digital Millennium yeah. Copyright Act is the thing that says like, websites aren't responsible for everything that's uploaded to the website unless they see it. So you have to make best efforts to take something down if it's someone else's IP or something. On a blockchain, once it's minted, so once it exists on a blockchain, it's there. So like DC came out with a thing saying, hey, I appreciate that everyone wants to put Batman stuff on as NFTs and then sell it. You can't do that, right? And if we find you doing it, we're going to sell the person that buys it, the person that minted it, the website it's on. We're going to sue everybody, right? So... And there's going to be a lot more of that in the future. Like the scary part. What if somebody puts revenge porn up on the blockchain? Can't take it Mm. down. It's there, right? Mm. So the only way to really nail it is to like shut down every point of access to sale. And that's complicated too because a lot of it's happening out of Russia or Ukraine or Southeast Asia or like places where American governance doesn't exist at the same level. So yeah, NFTs are the most frightening thing happening in the world right now and the coolest thing happening in the world right now. Like so many digital things, you know? but look, NFTs actually have been around for a while. What sparked the uh, this particular interest in it at this point in time? So the the global interest of it was sparked in two separate ways. So one is block uh, ICOs or, or coins like you know uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, everything like that started spiking in value again. And all this stuff is cyclical, whether or not it's a pump and dump or a scam or scheme, whatever, you can decide that for yourself. But for some reason, Bitcoin, which everyone thought was possibly dead and it was never going to get above 20,000 again, went back up to 60,000. And in the blockchain universe, when there's excitement around one coin, it has a tendency to rise everything. So Ethereum spiked, altcoins spiked, everything spiked. So a lot of these companies that are doing NFTs actually make a fair amount of money by starting their own token. So they do their own ICO. Like Flow is the token of, uh, of Top Shot. So when these things have a lot of value, they find themselves with a lot of money. And that happens both ways, right? So one is the people who are actually minting it. They know that they can go out and sell that token and then make a ton of money on the token sale alone. And the utility of it is the NFT. And on the other side, there's a bunch of people who are sitting with a bunch of of tokens. They might have like all of a sudden ETH 10x, right? So Ethereum 10x in value. So they find themselves from having $10,000 in ETH to having $100,000 in ETH. And they know the second that they take out that money, from their wallet the irs comes knocking on your door and they say all right Mm. here we go it's time give us our forty thousand dollars from that they don't want to do that right so instead what they're doing is going out and buying nfts with it because they find themselves flush with money it's a different way to diversify your investment so those two things kind of came together uh along with the launch of nba top shot uh which was the first kind of fun nft thing that happened that was super fun and accessible and you can buy it in us dollars and you can collect moments from NBA history, and it feels like you're opening up basketball card packs. And that just blew up as well. So all these things kind of came together into this witch's brew of good press stories. And then it just mm. kind of blew up from there. Look, you said, obviously, um, the first foray has been pretty boring in terms of gifts and so forth. Mm. But it seemed when it seems like when you combine something like passion and the idea of the NFT itself, like, you know, um, like you just explained... Um, with the basketball example, um, or you know the sporting example generally, um, it can really gain a lot of traction really fast. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And frankly, it's you know what Top Shot is doing is about as good as it gets right now. 
But it's also, you can think of, I mean, we're all smart guys. We all live within digital. You can think of a billion ways they could be doing it better. Like, how can I actually display the moments that I bought in an interesting way? Right now, you can string them out into a video and they put music behind it. And then you can share it on social media. Meh, that's fine, right? It'd be so much cooler if I had like a fully virtualized basketball court. And then I was able to put them around. Or like what they're doing with hard court where you can play them like a game. Right? Mm. That becomes interesting. And they've even teased the idea of... Well, you'll be able to level up your moments. And then, so one moment might become more valuable if you play them in the mobile game and, like, gain experience points. Like, it's Final Fantasy, right? That starts to become really interesting because it's interactive. And then it starts to become really, really interesting when they have this idea of lending. So, like, if you're an influencer, I can lend you my LeBron James moment. And then you can go, like, play it in a game or put it on a stream. And then I get it back because it was just lended. But on the ledger, it says, hey, PewDiePie had this for 48 hours and immediately goes from a $5,000 moment to a $30,000 moment. Like all of these innovations are going to be what really sparks something interesting. Right now, it's like people are still kind of like throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what sticks. Oh, man, it sounds like there's so many different things that can happen here. I think everyone is scrambling madly to see, yeah. so, so to think where it's going to go. But look, I'm, in terms of, of that, we can see there's massive potential. Um, how does this specifically relate to the world of like creators? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of creators have dipped their toe into NFTs, a little, some more successful than others. Like probably the splashiest was Logan Paul, um, which kind of um, took... I mean, he punted on the NFT. I think that nobody disagrees with that. It was like a hand-drawn, terrible thing that kind of looked like a Pokemon card. I don't think anyone was impressed by the actual quality of the art. Um, but that wasn't what he was going for. He combined it along with a contest where if you bought this $10,000 hand-drawn thing, um, you have a chance to win a box of Pokemon cards that was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and... There was kind of like some fun stories behind it in terms of the box break he was going to do later. And it was kind of a big splashy press story because NFTs were just starting to hit. And it all kind of came together and drove a million in sales and it did okay. So a lot of creators went, oh, cool. You can take any piece of crap. You throw it up on the blockchain. I'm going to make money. I won't mention the failures since then, but there's been a fair amount of like bigger creators that have like put their press stories out that are like, I did, here's my hand-drawn drawings. And they put them on rareable or open seas or one of those for a thousand dollars and they don't sell any of them right even the super mm. fans are like we're i think that what people are really missing on the creator side is two things so one is this is e-commerce right you're you're trying to convert your audience to buy a thing and then they want to feel like they have commiserate value it's like buying a hoodie or a water bottle or anything right i don't care how big of a super fan you are if they're like, hey, go buy my T-shirt and the T-shirt is so embarrassingly bad or you'll never wear it, then you're not going to get commiserate value. And right now, unfortunately, the value of NFTs is the resale value for the most part. Because when you get an NFT, what do you do with it, right? There's not a dominant metaverse yet where I can hang it up in my virtual house and say, there you go, I own an NFT. When that happens, sure. But right now it's like, it's an investment thing, which frankly, I think a lot of people like, the SEC could come knocking on my door for saying that because you talk to any core NFT person. They're like, no, 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 you can't say that. It's a utility. Like, it's that actual, <laughs> like, you're buying the art. No, nobody's buying the art. Like, they're, These are a lot of blockchain enthusiasts who are buying it, hoping it'll go up in value. So I think that that's kind of one side of it. Creators can play along on that side, which is like, how do you, you know, find ways to drive e-commerce and feel like somebody's owning something exclusive and interesting and a part of you like um for example owning your jack dorsey's first tweet i would put on that level right where it's like that's interesting enough that it feels like whoever owns that has real value um then the other side of the coin uh nfts is a terrible name non-fungible token nobody gets it it should never have been called nfts and the fact that people are still calling it nfts and expecting people to buy it is embarrassing um, what we should have done is stayed with what crypto kitties did two and a half years ago when they essentially launched the first popular NFT thing and call it digital collectibles. Cause that's all they are. Right. And that feels unintimidating. And then you get the point of it more, right? It's a little different than like a Funko pop or Lee. I see you've got star Wars figures in the background. Those are collectibles, right? 
And this is just a digital version of that. And let's think of everything that entails, right? Digital collectibles are no different than Top Shot. Uh, a basketball card collectible is a basketball card you own. A Top Shot moment is a moment from a thing you own. But there's scarcity to it. And there's commons and there's rares. And there's a pack unboxing and it's really exciting to see what you get. And then you can go in a secondary market and you can sell it. And you say, oh, mine is uh, worth more than yours. And therefore, like... I'll sell this for $12 so I can save up the money to buy the LeBron for $24 because it's more interesting. Like, that's the spirit of a digital collectible. So what a lot of creators are missing right now that I'm hoping they embrace is, how do I make this a campaign rather than a one-off, right? Funko Pop, if they would have just released the Deadpool Funko Pop and said, there you go, go buy it. I don't think a lot of people would be excited about Funko Pops right now. What was exciting about Funko Pops is that they licensed every ip under the sun they made them all in the same kind of model right where they all have the big heads and little bodies and then it's fun about how you interpret it and how you display your fandom through it likewise i think that people need to be creators need to be thinking of it in terms of like all right how do i make this like i drop five this week and then i drop another five next week and another five next week and you got to catch them all so make sure that if you get interested in week two you go back and bid for week one and Maybe I have contests around who's building the most and leaderboards, and now it starts to feel like an actual collectible. Phil, uh, speaking of collectibles, because you've got a pretty impressive collection behind you, I'm wondering, have you bought an NFT? Yeah, absolutely. So, that I mean, I mostly focus on Top Shot right now because it's the most fun. And I feel like NF it's, it's, NFTs, like any kind of fun, interesting investment thing, you should be playing with funny money. Anybody who's, like, trying to... Like, if this doesn't turn a profit, then I'm going to lose my house. Probably not looking at collectibles the right way. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go out and buy the $10,000 digital art or, like, the crypto punks. That, like, I don't want to do it just because it's just too risky of an investment for somebody like me. But what I do have fun with is, like, the fact that Top Shot has declared such an interesting and fun future. The fact that the moments are something that everybody starts to get a shorthand for and you can go on the discord server and nerd out about it and you can watch the twitch stream when they're doing packs for sale and you can complain about what a bad place in line you have like there's a community and culture built around it and that's what i really gravitate towards i'm doing a lot less of like the rareable super rare most of that is me consulting other people that want to do it well where i'm like hey it's your money like I'll tell you what you should buy and what has, might actually go up in value, but like, I'm not going to do it. Because frankly, a lot of these platforms are mm. built on top of Ethereum blockchain. And there's a big problem happening with ETH right now, which is it went up in value so much that the gas fees became astronomical. And what gas fees are is the uh, amount of money you have to pay in order to do a transaction or mint something on a blockchain. So now ETH is like $50 to $100 just to do a transaction. So if I'm buying a $3 thing at Rarible, I'm paying $53 to $103 to buy that thing. And to me, it's like, I, I don't know, because at that point, you need to be buying something for 1000 or 1500 or $2,000 just to make that fee feel like it's nothing. And I'm just not confident enough on anything on there that I want to drop that kind of money. I'd rather go buy more retro Nintendo games off eBay. Yeah, well, that was where I was really thinking is that until we hit that period where the, you know, Ready Player One Oasis is a reality and it is everything is virtual, you know, what, what that future is going to be in the interim. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's also a way, I guess, like, I guess creators could do it. Like they've been talking about, what well, can I make my videos an NFT, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, what are the implications of that long term? Like, you know, can I get, you know, if somebody else owns it, can I get recurring, you know, revenue from it when it's sold and that kind of thing? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you can get recurring revenue when it's sold, but the odds of it getting sold are almost nothing unless you have Nyan Cat or unless you have, you know, like Charlie bit my finger. Like, sure, if it's an iconic piece of internet history, sure. I think that there's a lot of naivety in the space where people think that if I mint it, they will come, and it's just not true. We've, we've seen creators and many, many millions of followers mint NFTs that have just tanked. And I think that people are looking at this as a gold rush, and that's almost always the wrong way to look at a new... Uh, like, I, it reminds me of YouTube in, like, 2013 or so, when they said, all right, we have monetization for all. Anybody who's, like, a thousand subscribers, something very, very low, can all monetize their videos. And what happened is exactly what you thought would be happened. Everybody stole all the vines, and they uploaded vine compilation channels, and they created terrible, terrible clickbait... 
And it just became this horribly like scammy gold rush la land grab. And a lot of those channels went away pretty quickly. Some of them were able to scam for a month or two, but they didn't build lasting careers. And frankly, more of them failed than succeeded. And the ones that really survived were the ones that said, okay, monetization on YouTube is a thing and you can do pretty well with it. How do I build something that lasts for 10 years or 20 years or 100 years? How do I build real IP? And I think likewise, the people in the NFT space who are going to do well with this are not people who think like, Oh, how do I mint my videos as NFTs? Because what are you really adding to the world by doing that, right? Like it, at that point, what are you giving your fans that's not just a cash grab? It's junk and you know it's junk because your fans have already seen it on YouTube. Like you're taking your fans for a ride and it's going to have no resale value. If what do you say instead is like, oh, I am this, like I'm, let's say I'm rooster teeth and I've got all these behind the scenes outtakes from us doing red versus blue in those very early days when it was just a bunch of kids in an apartment before we hit it big. And I'm going to mint that as an NFT. Now we're talking, right? That's a piece of internet history that's fun and exclusive and interesting. And if people come at it with that mindset, they can do exceptionally well. Unfortunately, most people aren't coming at it with that mindset. Yes, also the the aspect of it is around accessibility too, right? Because they just people are going NFT mad but don't realize it's like so much of the audience or people who are their fans can't actually transact or don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if anybody has tried to set up a MetaMask wallet recently, but it's terrible. <laughs> and it's even worse to try to get money into that MetaMask wallet. Like, that's another thing. Not to keep talking about Top Shot as, like, this perfect symbol because they've got their own problems, but you can transact in dollars. And, yes, it does have to open up your Flow wallet, but it feels like an Amazon checkout. It's very, very easy. Except the only difference is they have the extra step of instead of Amazon saying, pay me $40, and you go, okay, and here's $40, it says you have to load your wallet. So load your wallet with $100, and then you can keep transacting out of that, like PayPal, right? Um, so they're doing it right, but the other platforms, yeah, there's a reason why – relatively few people are actual buyers on things like open seas and rareable and all of those. It's because you need to have a computer science degree to figure out how to put money into your wallet. Right. And it's a lot of people with a lot of, you know, cryptocurrency, just trading NFTs back and forth and inflating the value. And I have a feeling once those things go away, we're going to start seeing things that are actually priced at the value they should be priced at. Right. Like, a piece of art from a new artist probably shouldn't be sold for more than 10 bucks or 20 bucks because you're a new artist and you're establishing yourself and it might go up eventually as you become the next Beeple. But for now you shouldn't be putting everything on the, you know, on the blockchain for $300. That's stupid, right? You're it's, you're not worth that much. And the same way with like YouTube videos, right? Once CPM started leveling out and people, you realize monetization for all might not be the right way because it leads to too much crap. Then you start to see the real businesses emerge. Mm. And like, that's the uh, the other side of like a lot of creators are, are asking, you know, some of them are like, they're genuinely interested, like, what can we do in the NFT space? Um, you know, if I put one out, will the audience buy it? Is there actually any value in it long term? Um, but yeah, the accessibility issue is is one thing, but also it can alienate an audience, right? If they yeah. think you're doing a, I mean, generally, I think audiences are getting more understanding about creators needing to make money. But if they're doing something that seems like a blatant cash grab or they've been gouged and only some part of the audience can partake in it, especially you, know, you might have a mega fan who can't partake in it. Um, or especially if your fans are young, for example, and they don't have access to, you know, the wallets and the ability to put cash in them that can really put an audience offside. Right. Oh yeah. Well, there was, I, again, I won't use names cause I don't want to diss anybody for not understanding the market. Right. Like everybody's trying their best but there was one creator who has a mostly young male audience like under 18 young male audience very very big creator who minted nfts put them for sale on one of those sites where you have to download a crypto wallet and put in your social security number in order to do it minted the nfts for a thousand dollars a piece and it's like what are you doing like don't you know your own audience no one in your audience has a thousand dollars to burn nobody in your audience wants to put their social security number into anything and the nfts weren't that exclusive or interesting right it was like it was clear that it was something that was done in a night and not done with love over many, mm. many weeks that would warrant a thousand dollar price tag. So yeah, you can alienate your audience like crazy. You've just got to, I mean, that's the thing is like all sales should also be a partnership. Like I sell you a hoodie that's got my logo on it for $30. You get $30 worth of use out of it. So you don't leave going like, oh, I got screwed. A lot of creators don't think that way. They think that this is like, 
how do I get as much money as I possibly can? And those creators tend to go away a lot faster. The ones that give back to their audience and think of their audience as partners in all of this, they're the ones that have been around for 15 years and will be around for 15 more. Yeah, and look, that does seem to be a trend with the big creators we work with who are looking in the space and thinking, well, how can I actually add value in this? And you know, they're looking at it more as a, a test and a foray into it rather than a, a cash grab. And I think that's probably the, the right way to do it. Yeah. Um, but there are, like you said, a, a lot of uh, pros and cons. And I think one of the cons that obviously we're seeing a lot of and people aren't thinking about as much because they just don't understand the process is the environmental impact of yeah. NFTs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And frankly, that's, I mean, it's an Ethereum and, and Bitcoin issue, right? Because what a lot of people don't realize is those gas fees that you're getting is really the, the cost that it takes to pay off the miners. And the reason why it costs 50 to to $100 is that's how much electricity they're burning through in order to, I mean, not to overly simplify, there's other reasons, but it is like, that's, that's the environmental impact you're paying for. It's essentially like a carbon offset tax for lack of a better term. But there's mm. a lot of really nimble blockchains. There's a reason why you're not paying those kind of gas fees on flow for top shot. Those are, I mean, I don't want to get too much into the technical reasons, but they don't use as much, right? They're more carbon neutral than others. Um, there's a few companies that I'm consulting for that are early in that space. And because of the backlash and because they're just good people of, of the environmental impacts, none of them are building on blockchains that, that are hurting the environment. And would, would, I guess maybe even the carbon offset, um, I guess not the market, but the ability will, will become a big thing too, right? Because people, I think more about the environment and, you know, we have creators who are also concerned about that space they're like oh i want to do this but like what's the <laughs> what's yeah. the cost really and i think that comes down to the fact that like you explained like you know how gas works and the and the mining element too and the how power intensive it is when i first heard that i mean i'd never been really into, into blockchain or understood much but when i looked at it and looked into what was required i'm like i could not believe how much you know electricity and processing is required in order to to work the process oh yeah um and look, we'll put links in the show notes so you can understand this process better because it is a, it is like we, we'd spend a whole session just explaining how this works. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is really um, intensive in energy and therefore intensive on the environment. So that'll be another thing we've got to watch out for, especially as popularity increases. Well, it's funny. I think that a lot of people have a misconception about mining because the idea of mining Bitcoin, which is digital, and then being able to get it and then make hundreds of thousands of dollars each time you mine a, a tranche of Bitcoin seems foreign to people. I, my, my favorite way that it's explained is it's like Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory where you've got the candy bars and you're just unwrapping one after another, trying to find the golden ticket. And it's the same way, right? Is that what you're doing when you're mining for blockchain is trying to kind of like decrypt two sides of things and match them together and say, Nope, that's not right. Match those two together. Nope, that's not right. And again and again and again, until you're the one that finds that next group of blockchain, right? Or that next bit of Bitcoin. So in order to do that, you have to have, most of these are like server farms with tons of computers running like crazy on very high-end equipment to just match things as quickly as possible over and over and over again. And the energy consumption is crazy just for the chance of maybe finding some Bitcoin. And if you do, you get a huge payday. You can make hundreds of thousands of dollars, but for the most part, you're running all these servers and you're just failing, 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 failing. And you're doing like another $100 electricity bill, another $100 electricity bill, another $100 electricity bill to maybe someday spend $30,000 in electricity to maybe make $200,000 in Bitcoin. And that's how these miners work. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's so many things to it. I think, I, and I guess because it's sort of been in, in many ways for many people um, behind a curtain and people not really understanding it. And now sort of things like, you know the the rise in bitcoin again and um and this focus on nfts everyone's sort of rushing into it and not thinking about these other aspects that that go alongside it but look, look that's that aside um what do you think then is the ideal um approach for a creator at this point in time what should they be focusing on going forward if they are interested in the space how should they approach it yeah absolutely i'd say that uh when you're coming up first of all if you're sitting with a sheet of paper trying to figure out your nft strategy just write digital collectible at the top of your paper and keep reminding yourself of that right if it's something that doesn't feel collectible you probably shouldn't be doing it or i mean there's another side of that coin right if you're like if you're going to get actual really great developers behind it and you're going to like mint a sword that can be played in a game and gain experience points every time you slay a dragon like 
that's not necessarily like a core collectible, but you should probably do that if you have the capability to do that. I'm just talking about if you're somebody who's like a video first creator or a photographer or a fine artist, like then you really should think about collectibles and collectibles have a couple of things, right? One is that they have kind of scarcity, like there's commons, there's rares, there's super rares. You've got to think in terms of that. Um, they've got kind of themes built around them, right? Like you don't, you can't say it's a collectible if one's a Funko pop and one's a rock, right? Those are not collectible together. So you need to think of it in terms of a campaign around a, a singular brand. And then you've got to start thinking about, is it actual real value to my fans, right? Is it something that's going to be fun for them to collect? Is it on brand with me? Is it like, like one thing that I like to point to as something that did it particularly well is crypto punks. And a lot of people look at that and they say, well, they're kind of like even sub 8-bit. They look like almost like Atari faces of characters. But what they did do is a really cool rollout strategy where they offered them all for free and let the the resale market be the thing that juices the value. And they're all based around one theme. They all have kind of the same style. And if you get the one that looks like a cop and you're somebody who's like really into cop movies, then that feels like it should be something really necessary for you. Like it's fun and it's themed and it's interesting. And if you're thinking about it in terms of that way of like, I'm going to collect as many of these as I can and watch it go up and down value. And that's fun. You're going to be fine, right? You don't want to be the other side of the coin, which is like, here, I'm going to drop three pictures that are just pieces of garbage and mint them for a lot and hopes to sucker someone into it. Switching gears for a second. I'm interested to see like to the, the next evolution of what that, uh, that is, especially because like you, for example, uh, work in virtual worlds, right? So, you know, People are asking questions about the new forms of currency that are going to work there. And, you know, with, with NFTs that might live um, or be more suited to a, a virtual world, for example, where you can see it, it'll be more tangible. Um, it'll be something that can probably, you know, you can actually see the value in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, right now, most virtual worlds that are really explosive, like your Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite, um, these are all still conducting their commerce in USD, right? It's just dollars dollar in dollar out um and that's because it's easy and it's young audiences and you wanted to feel that kind of seamless thing now where it starts to get really interesting with nfts is what if i want to take my skin from fortnite and then put it into another game that epic does right so that it's something that can be kind of taken out of that universe i feel actual agency and ownership over it and then i can put it into another context well, at that point, having a cryptocurrency backend starts to make a lot of sense because you want something to be able to leave an environment that's not a walled garden and then put it into another environment. So that's when you start looking at like, well, what's the true metaverse going to look like? Something where you actually have true ownership of the things inside of it, right? And what it will look a lot like is, first of all, people being able to control their environments. They got to play God a little bit because that's part of the metaverse, right? As you saw with Ready Player One, like you need that feeling. And two is you need to have true, true, true ownership of the things that are inside it. So if you're not, it's just a game, right? If it's something where like I can build a house, but then the game can reset to season two and then the house is gone. It doesn't really feel like I'm doing a live simulation of a virtual world. It feels like I'm inside somebody else's sandbox. And that starts to look a heck of a lot like cryptocurrency and NFTs, right? You want it to mm -hmm. be stable. You want it to be transportable. You want it to have its own in-game economy. Like when all of these things come together, I think that the eventual dominant metaverse is going to have all of these. And do you think those, the worlds that will probably be or take off faster, the worlds that sort of limit friction, like you point, like you pointed out, um, you know, with the top shots thing about it being such a, a much easier process to get involved with. Do you think yeah. that will make it be a play a big factor? Yeah, I mean, f the the one kind of constant in all of internet content history is friction is not fun. And it mm. needs to be a fun experience. So everything from the dominance of Amazon and shopping to why Facebook took over MySpace. And you can track all of this stuff back to ease of use. And of course, there's exceptions, right? Twitch streaming is still incredibly hard to do. But also those are gamers and there's cool factor behind, you know, being the person who's able to set up OBS and figure out how to pc games like there's a little bit of that there in that culture so i don't want to say every time but for the most part things that get mass 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 adoption like facebook right those are things that have to just look at every point of friction and just shave it off shave it off shave it off it's going to be the same way with the metaverse it's partially why we're doing what we're doing at wormhole where we're creating the metaverse for the real world is we realize that you're not going to get mass adoption when you're in a gaming environment because most people 
will think Roblox is too young for them or don't want to play a shooting game so they won't play Fortnite. Like, you're never going to get mom and dad to do those things because it feels like a game. But you can get them on Facebook because Facebook has real-life impact. It's got real-life people on it. It feels like you're interacting in a real way. So if you're able to build a metaverse on top of the real world where you can feel that agency and control, but also it's infinitely scalable and new content will always happen because it's just a simulation of the real world, that starts to become a more interesting version of the metaverse in my book. Oh, look, mate, this is, it's, a, it's a super fascinating area. Um, we're, but we've, <laughs> we've actually reached time in terms of, of, uh, of this episode. You know, what Ant, you know what Ant would say at this point? It's like, we are not out of time, Farad. We still have to do the rabbit hole. <laughs> yes. Actually, we, the rabbit hole, or, or the wormhole, yeah. I guess, in this case. It's like we, right. At the end of these sessions, what we like to do is like say, hey, look, where has the rabbit hole taken you down in terms of the content you've seen online? It could be, you know, on YouTube, yeah, it could be on TikTok. Where, where, where is it taking you? What interesting things have you discovered in the wonderful world of, of online video? Oh, geez. I mean, my the number one thing that came to my mind was not video, it was Twitter, right? When you start looking in corners of Twitter, it starts to get to be a really scary or, or like, I love K-pop Twitter. <laughs> um, but that's not a great answer, so I'll escape that. I, just, I'm, I mean, like everybody who's worked in digital media for a while, I sit and watch TikTok in awe every single day as much as I humanly can. And my favorite TikToks, and maybe it's because I grew up on America's Funniest Home Videos because I'm of that <laughs> generation, is very, very old people dancing to very, very young music. And you can see a lot of it, like the, the most like ratchet hip hop song. <laughs> in the entire world that you can hear with swear words is talking about sex, whatever you will see a 90 year old grandma doing a very, very fun dance to it. And it just brings me infinite glee. How about you, Lee? Where have you been? I mean, as you know, I really like Screen Junkies. Screen Junkies then leads me to Fandom Entertainment, which then leads me to the Send Network. And recently I've been watching something called All My Movies, which is uh, one of the creators who used to be on Screen Junkies. He essentially takes a DVD off the shelf and he'll review over an hour. The movie, the process gives you lots of facts. And I really like that because he also then goes into the special features of the DVD. So it's kind of this harken back to physical media, um, but you get a, a fun exploration of an old movie because he goes through the 70s and 80s and all the classics. So um, yeah, I've spent a lot of time going through his DVD collection. Very nice. What about you, Fred? I have actually, I don't know how I even got into this area. I've been um, looking at how they build giant engines like ship engines like what goes not plane that. engines i don't know I, interesting not, not plane plane i'm across plane engines but i i was fascinated but like these enormous machines and how ship engines work and i don't know why obviously you end up in this you know the, the the rabbit hole and yeah just watching how they build these enormous things and it doesn't take a lot of people but just the fascinating technology that, that goes into them and, and how robust they have to be in order to perform what they do so wow. i don't know how i ended up there but it was uh it took many hours of <laughs> It happens. Watching. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Phil, look, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, like, like, there are so many areas we still want to chat about. Um, but you know, you've, I think you provided a really good outline of what NFTs are, how they work for creators, what they should be focusing on, what they should be wary of. Um, mate, thanks so much for joining us. Hopefully, we get to chat to you again soon. Yeah, let me know. Find me on uh, social media if you want to geek out about NFTs. I'm at Phil Ranta on every platform. Uh, and look, that's actually where I where I first see, I first see you on LinkedIn, and um, you have the most interesting uh, posts. So definitely, definitely check that out. Thank you, much appreciated. Thank you for having me. Create a generation. Look on the mic.